Hello everyone, I'm Professor Plink. I respond to various theological and ideological questions and claims from a rationalistic and naturalistic approach in an effort to give and explain the opposite viewpoint and help to balance the conversation. Before we get into today's video, a quick shout out to my most recent super thankers, Eric Mishima, long-haired lefty, Fred Harvey, Piao Mao Noir, and James Lamica. Thank you all very much for your generosity and the continued effort to stand up to theistic dogma. You are the skeptical edge on my atheistic axe, keeping it sharp so as to cleave religious ridiculousness from the social consciousness. Thank you very much for helping me to continue to do what I do. And you can help out too. If you like what you see, make sure to subscribe and click the bell so you'll always be notified when new content comes out. And of course, like this video and pop in a comment. All that really does go a long way towards pleasing the YouTube algorithm and keeping my channel motoring along. Now on to today's video. You know, I've responded to some of the flotsam that spews from the channel that is PragerU before, but they've always been hosted by various other commentators, and I've never actually had the chance to respond to the proprietor of that utterly fake institution of higher learning, Dennis Prager himself. Well, it is time that that was remedied. As a quick aside, while it may be just a catchy channel name and not meant to be taken literally, as an actual faculty member at a real institute of higher learning, I do find it mildly infuriating when ideologues couch their unsupported mental meanderings in academic language, like referring to their channel as a university. Or his ongoing master's program housed over at the Daily Wire, I mean, Prager is already not starting off on good footing with me. But in today's video, he's going to be telling us why, without the existence of God, murder isn't wrong. I wait with bated breath, Dennis. Take it away. Do you believe that good and evil exist? The answer to this question separates Judeo-Christian values from secular values. Well, I would say that I have secular values, and yes, I do believe in good and evil. But the problem here is going to be the same problem that always exists when you're discussing morality with a Christian or any theist who believes morality is God-derived. And that problem is that I don't believe in absolute, objective good and evil. And so to someone like Dennis, that actually means that I don't believe in good and evil at all, as far as he's concerned. But I do. It's just that I believe in subjective good and evil. I believe that all value judgments, and therefore all morality and conceptions of good and evil, are subjective. That doesn't mean that you can't declare some action as good or evil, just that you cannot call it objectively good or evil. But narrow thinkers like Dennis can't handle the idea of things being more complicated or nuanced than a simple black and white, this action am good, this action am bad, cause book tell me so. That kind of mentality. Let me offer the clearest possible example. Murder. Is murder wrong? Is it evil? Nearly everyone would answer yes. Diplomatic community. It's just been revoked. Remember, Sally, when I promised to kill you last? That's what made you... you did! I lied. But now I will pose a much harder question. How do you know? I'm sure you think murder is wrong, hmm. but how do you know? Murder, like pretty much everything else, is nuanced. I provided a few examples from films where a character is quite unambiguously murdered. And yet, when we all went and saw those films, and similar incidents in countless other films, we cheered or applauded, or at least smiled to ourselves in our approval of such acts. 
Are we all fundamentally evil people? Do we revel in evil actions? Or are there gray areas to something like unlawfully taking the life of another human? If it's done to someone who we feel really has it coming, a serial killer or CSA perpetrator, for instance, do we hem and haw over it near as much as we do if it were happening to a volunteer at the local soup kitchen getting stabbed during a mugging gone wrong? But in general, yes, most would say that murder, or unlawfully taking the life of another human, is wrong. I would stop short of calling it evil because it's not always the case that it's an action predicated on enjoying causing pain or misery in others, which is what I would classify as being a necessary component of evil. But is it wrong? Sure. And how do we know that? Well, we have cultural and societal standards that have existed since the dawn of mankind that are necessary for the maintenance of the social cohesion that we thrive on. You can't have a functioning society that allows people to murder others whenever they might feel like it. And any time in history that there's been a society that has allowed one group to kill another, that society has collapsed utterly and been regarded by history as an evil one. And history, in this case, is not necessarily controlled by the victor. As modern American society was built on the wholesale slaughter of the Native American populations, and we cultural descendants of that society look back and recognize our own countrymen's wrongness in doing so. And the key thing here, Dennis, is that none of this needs to be mandated by a god. If I asked you how you know that the Earth is round, you would show me photographs from outer space or offer me measurable data. But what photographs could you show, what measurements could you provide that prove that murder or theft is wrong? The fact is, you can't. This is a weak analogy fallacy. When an analogy is used to prove or disprove an argument, but the analogy is too dissimilar to be effective, that is, it is unlike the argument more than it is like the argument. You can't compare the shape of the earth with the nature of right and wrong. See, in argumentation, there are three types of propositions one can make. There are propositions of fact, propositions of value, and propositions of policy. Propositions of fact are things that are objectively true or not true, like increased greenhouse gases related to human activity cause global warming. That statement is either true or false. Opinions on the issue do not matter. Propositions of value are, as the term implies, value judgments. They are subjective assessments of something's rightness or wrongness, like Americans' disproportionately large amount of pollution relative to other countries is wrong. And then propositions of policy advocate for a change in the way things are done. There should be stricter emissions restrictions on individual cars. So a statement like, the earth is round, is a proposition of fact. A statement like, murder is wrong, however, is a proposition of value. As they are fundamentally different types of arguments, you cannot use the same approach to trying to prove them both in the same way. Yes, you would use images or measurements for the shape of the earth, because that is evidence to establish a fact. But with a value judgment, there's no such fact to support. It's opinion. Different types of arguments and support need to be used in order to sway opinion, which is what any value judgment is ultimately based on, and that makes it, therefore, subjective. There are scientific facts, but without God, there are no moral facts. In a secular world, there can only be opinions about morality. The same holds true in a theistic world. Only opinions can ever exist about morality. Even if God exists and wrote incontrovertible moral law that will stand forever and ever, guess what? It's still subjective. 
it's still only opinion because it's God's opinion. Just because in a theistic world, God has the power to judge people based on his idea of what is right and wrong, doesn't suddenly make it not an opinion. I mean, for shit's sake, Kim Jong-un has total, practically godlike authority in his country to decide what is right and wrong. Would you say that his power and worship makes his perspective on right and wrong incontrovertible fact? Or is he just enforcing his subjective belief about right and wrong? The point is that the power of the dictator in control has no bearing over whether or not their ideas on morality are objective or subjective. If notions of right and wrong are flowing from a thinking, willful being, that makes them inherently subjective, even if that being is an all-powerful god. They may be personal opinions or society's opinions, but only opinions. Every atheist philosopher I have read or debated on this subject has acknowledged that if there is no God, there is no objective morality. I'm an atheist, and we haven't debated, Dennis, but if we ever had, I would amend that statement to say that even if there is a God, there is no objective morality. For morality to be truly objective, it would have to exist in spite of God, not because of him. Moral law would have to be set naturally and automatically without God's intervention or creation of it, and then God could not ever alter it in any way. Which would mean that any God that existed was not actually all-powerful, since he wouldn't have the power to alter morality if it were truly objective. And if God is not all-powerful, then he is not the God that Christians, or many other religions, believe in, Thus, their beliefs are wrong. So, in short, Dennis, if objective morality actually exists, then that proves that your religion is wrong. Now, let me make two things clear. First, this doesn't mean that if you don't believe in God, you can't be a good person. There are plenty of kind and moral individuals who don't believe in God and Judeo-Christian values. But the existence of these good people has nothing, nothing to do with the question of whether good and evil really exist if there is no God. Well, at least he's willing to acknowledge that much. But again, he misses the fundamental point, that good and evil can still exist in the mind of the non-faithful. We just acknowledge that good and evil are subjective. I mean, it's kind of weird. It's like if you say, I believe in good and evil, but that good and evil are all completely opinion-based, then people like Dennis instantly come back with, then you're saying that you don't believe good and evil exist at all. And we're like, did you even listen to what I said? Do you understand the words that are coming out of my mouth? I believe in good and evil, Dennis. Subjective, opinion-based good and evil. Which is an actual thing, despite your refusal to admit it. Second, there have been plenty of people who believed in God who were not good people. Indeed, more than a few have been evil and have even committed evil in God's name. The existence of God doesn't ensure people will do good. I wish it did. The existence of God only ensures that good and evil objectively exist and are not merely opinions. No, it doesn't. It ensures that one opinion, one subjective conception of good and evil, will be forever paramount over the opinions of all others. And for no other reason than because that cosmic tough guy has the power to judge everyone by his opinions for all time. But does that make them in any way not opinions? No. No, it doesn't. Without God, we therefore end up with what is known as moral relativism, meaning that morality is not absolute, but only relative to the individual or to the society. Without God, the words good and evil are just another way of saying, I like and I don't like. If there is no God, the statement murder is evil 
is the same as the statement, I don't like murder. Eh, no. For starters, we all do operate with moral relativism all the time. Everyone acknowledges the fact that practically everyone around them disagrees with them to some degree about what is right and what is wrong. Is it okay to call your friend an a-hole if you mean it in jest? What is the level of closeness one needs to be with a friend before you can start using disparaging language like that towards them? What's an appropriately priced gift to buy someone for their birthday if you've only been friends with them for a few months? Should I get them anything at all? Will that make them feel obligated to get me something on my birthday? But I know that they've been strapped for cash lately and I don't want to put them in that position, so is it right for me to do so? Etc. We wrestle with a massive variety of moral quandaries every day of our lives with varying levels of severity, most of them admittedly pretty low in importance. But the fact is that whatever decision we come to with these questions, there would be countless people who would disagree with the conclusions we come to. Everyone disagrees on the specifics and the minutia of morality. So don't act like moral relativism is a nonsense way to live. We all live that way all the time, day in and day out. But then when it comes down to more severe moral questions and implications, like is murder wrong, it isn't down to I like or I don't like. The more important question is, what is my cultural framework and societal standards position on this? Do I agree with that position personally? And if so, how far am I willing to push my disagreement with the societal standard? That's why Murtaugh shot the guy who had diplomatic immunity. That's why Arnold let go of the guy he was holding over the cliff. They knew that, by their societal standard and the cultural framework that they existed in, that they were doing something that would be considered wrong. But they disagreed with it enough to do it anyway. And many of us watching agreed with their decision to do so, showcasing again moral relativism. See, Dennis, it's just a bit more complex than I like or I don't like. And it's also more complex than God likes or God doesn't like. Seriously, elevate your thinking beyond this childish black and white way of looking at the world. Now, many will argue that you don't need moral absolutes. People won't murder because they don't want to be murdered. But that argument is just wishful thinking. Hitler, Stalin, and Mao didn't want to be murdered but that hardly stopped them from murdering about a hundred million people. It is not a coincidence that the rejection of Judeo-Christian values in the Western world by Nazism and Communism led to the murder of all these innocent people. People who don't want to kill, don't kill, regardless of their religious affiliation or lack thereof. Bad people who want to kill, will kill regardless of their religious affiliation or lack thereof. And stop trying to paint Nazism and Hitler as atheistic. They weren't. Hitler was a Christian. He publicly admitted as much and never recanted or amended that claim. And Nazi Germany was, I mean, only a mere 94% Christian, with 54% being Protestants and 40% being Catholic, then after some scant few non-Christian believers, a mere 1.5% were officially non-believers, i.e. atheists. In short, one does not need Judeo-Christian values to not be a killer. And one who does espouse Judeo-Christian values is not necessarily going to refrain from killing. And there's never been any kind of link discovered between atheism and increased tendencies towards violence or killing. In fact, there have been studies that have found the exact opposite, that the more religious an area is, there's an increase in violence. But why let facts get in the way of a good story, right, Dennis? It is also not a coincidence that the first societies in the world to abolish slavery an institution that existed in every known society in human history 
were Western societies rooted in Judeo-Christian values. Leviticus 25.44 As for your male and female slaves whom you have, you may buy male and female slaves from among the nations that are around you. You may also buy from among the strangers who sojourn with you and their clans that are with you who have been born in your land, and they may be your property. You may bequeath them to your sons after you to inherit as a possession forever. Exodus 21.1 When you buy a Hebrew slave, he shall serve six years, and in the seventh he shall go out free for nothing. If he comes in single, he shall go out single. If he comes in married, then his wife shall go out with him. If his master gives him a wife, and she bears him sons or daughters, the wife and her children shall be her masters, and he shall go out alone. But if the slave plainly says, I love my master, my wife, and my children, I will not go out free, then his master shall bring him to God, and he shall bring him to the door or the doorpost, and his master shall bore his ear through with an awl, and he shall be his slave forever. Ephesians 6, five, Slaves, obey your earthly masters with respect and fear, and with sincerity of heart, just as you would obey Christ. Don't bring your Christianity is opposed to slavery bullshit around here, Dennis. I like this one. Yeah. Exodus 21, verses 20 21. Mm -hmm. When a man strikes his slave with a rod so hard that the slave dies, he shall be punished. If, however, the slave survives for a day or two, he is not to be punished for the slave is his property. That's, that's not what I'm talking about, though. That's a different, that's not my thing. Today, the rejection of Judeo-Christian values and moral absolutes has led to a world of moral confusion. In the New York Times in March 2015, a professor of philosophy confirmed this. He wrote, What would you say if you found out that our public schools were teaching children that it is not true that it's wrong to kill people for fun? Would you be surprised? I was. The professor then added, The overwhelming majority of college freshmen view moral claims as mere opinions. So what Dennis is referencing here, even though he fails to throw up a citation or even mention the author by name, is an article written by Justin McBrayer on March 2nd of 2015, entitled, Why Our Children Don't Think There Are Moral Facts. And Dennis doesn't want you to know the context of the article, because the way he laid it out, it makes it seem like public schools are teaching children that there is nothing at all wrong with murdering for fun. But of course, this isn't the case, and this article does not state or even imply that this is the case. The article is about the philosophical difference between fact and opinion where morality is concerned. It doesn't conclude that children are taught that there's nothing at all wrong with murder. Just that murder being wrong is an opinion as all moral judgments are opinions. That they aren't absolute. That they are nuanced. That they're contextual. And while McBrayer doesn't agree with that stance, and believes that there are moral facts that should be taught as such, he doesn't claim that schools are teaching kids that murder for fun is A-OK. -okay. So then, whatever you believe about God or religion, here is a fact. Without a God who is the source of morality, morality is just a matter of opinion. No, Dennis. Even with a God who is the source of morality, morality is still just an opinion. It's just the opinion of your God who has the power to force his opinions down everyone's throat. If morality is incontrovertible fact, then it supersedes God himself, thus making God incapable of altering it, thus not all-powerful, thus not the omnipotent God you claim to believe in, thus your belief is proven false. So this was all standard Dennis Prager fluff and nonsense, the kind he's been peddling for years. Unsourced citations, out-of-context quotes, implications that are patently false, like Hitler being an atheist, 
Claims of Christian moral superiority, while ignoring the grossly immoral aspects of the Bible itself, let alone the disgusting actions of the church and faithful who claim to live by those values. Oversimplification of complex sociocultural systems and childish, narrow-minded, black-and-white thinking about complicated philosophical issues. All wrapped up in a hefty helping of smarm and all the charm of a used car salesman. So, to Dennis, and more broadly to all the fine folks at Prager University, for declaring yourselves an educational organization, even facetiously, and then delivering religious and conservative propaganda chocked full of half-truths, no-truths, and utter BS, a final message to you. Get bent. (gasps) That's my third monocle this week. I simply must stop being so horrified. And that is where we'll close things off for today. So thanks for watching, everyone. Don't forget to like this video, comment, and subscribe, so you'll always be notified when a new video comes out. Until next time, I'm Professor Plink, reminding you to keep striving for greater understanding It's the best way to get wherever you want to go.